Hello, everyone. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, my name is Matei Tikinelian. I'm a second year PhD student in the Kautzen Institute of Archaeology. Um, so before we begin, I would like to read a short statement. The Kautzen Institute at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tova Angar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honuk Vetam ancestors, Ahihirom elders, and Eyo Hiinkem, our relatives, relations past, present, and emerging. Dr. Ayana Omilade Flewellen is a Black feminist, an archaeologist, a storyteller, storyteller sorry, um, and an artist. As a scholar of anthropology and African and African diaspora studies, Flewellen's intellectual genealogy is shaped by critical theory rooted in Black feminist epistemology and pedagogy. This epistemological backdrop not only constructs the way she designs, conducts, and produces her scholarship, but acts as a foundation to how she advocates for greater diversity within the field of archaeology and within the broader scope of academia. Flewellen is the co-founder of the Society of Black Archaeologists and sits on the board of Diving with a Purpose. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Riverside. Her research and teaching interests are shaped by and speak to Black feminist theory historical archaeology, maritime heritage conservation, public and community engagement archaeology, processes of identity formation, and representations of slavery. Flo Willen has been featured in National Geographic and Science Magazine. Additionally, she has been invited to speak at institu institutions such as the National Museum for Women in the Arts, the National Park Service, and Stanford University. Now, please join me in welcoming Professor Flewellen. <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to share my work today with you all. Um, before I start my presentation, I wanna acknowledge the passing of Mary Boudry. I learned of her transition earlier this morning and I didn't know Mary personally, but she was a powerhouse in the field of historical archeology span and her research on small finds, specifically a dormant artifact, helped shape my scholarship in a tremendous way. So she'll be missed. So diving into the presentation, it's my hope that this talk will outline the flesh and texture of Black feminist archeology span as a theoretical and methodological framework that works to capture the lived experiences of past peoples at the intersections of their varying facets of identity including race, gender, and class. Through a discussion of my work at the Levi Jordan Plantation as an example of Black feminist practice, I will provide an overview of Black feminism, discuss the ways this theoretical framework has been used within the field of archeology span and avenues for future exploration of Black feminist archeology's span depths within the field. So amid the racialized Amid racialized servitude, sexual exploitation, and economic disenfranchisement that marked the post-emancipation era in the United States, African-American women were styling their hair with combs, lacing glass beads around their neck, dyeing coarse cotton fabric with indigo berry and sweet gum bark, and fastening buttons to adorn their bodies and dress their social lives. Through a synthesis of documentary and oral history and material culture data, my research uses the dormant practices Black women engaged in the post-emancipation era in Texas to examine how intersections of race, gender, class, operations of power and oppression shaped African-American identity formations during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This research rests as a foundation of my book project tentatively titled, The Will to Adorn, A Black Feminist Archaeology of Sartorial Choice in Post-Emancipated Texas which provides, this book provides a framework for testing inferences about the relationship the matrix of domination has to the formation of identity through the lens of dress during the post-emancipation era. In The Will to Adorn, I argue that everyday sartorial practices, how people dress their bodies um, for their everyday lives are practices of self-making that through their repetitive daily engagement constitute the body and form identities. 
Building off the work of Mary Ellen Roch Higgins and Joan B. Etchner, I define sartorial practices as social cultural practices shaped by many, intersect many intersecting operations of power and oppression, including racism, sexism, and classism that involve modifications of the corporal form. So imagine scarification, body piercings, and hair alteration, as well as all three-dimensional supplements that are then added to the body. So think clothing, hair combs, and jewelry. The emphasis on intersecting operations of power and oppression um, draw on intersectionality articulated by Kimberl Crenshaw, which rests as the basis of Black feminist theory canonized by Patricia Hill Collins, both of which ground my research question. Within this work, I deepened my engagement with Black feminist theory by articulating, and by articulating the intricate processes of racialization exploitive capitalism that laid at the foundation of wage and sharecropping families engagement with the Southern farming economy and practices of sexual exploitation, black women face in the field as agricultural workers and within the homes of white families that employed them. Additionally, this deepening engagement with black feminist theory seeks to strike a balance in the combination of both quantitative and qualitative analyses of material culture and documentary sources of data. My time as a fellow with the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery has really allowed me to hone my analytical methods by combing back through my data sets to find entryways for further um, quantitative analysis that highlights the material culture within the project and also fosters avenues of comparative analyses that were formerly unavailable. As Whitney Battle Baptiste, author of Black Feminist Archaeology articulated, quote, a Black feminist archaeology is not a formula. It's a methodology that combines aspects of anthropological theory, ethno-history and narrative tradition, oral history, material culture studies, Black and African descendant feminisms, and critical race and African diaspora theories. My work adds data sciences to this methodological tapestry, articulating Black feminist archaeology at the intersections of digital humanities, historical archaeology, and Black feminist theory. Within the book, I examine how intersections of race, gender, and class operations of power and oppression shaped African-American identity formations during the late 19th and 20th centuries. And by investigating why African-American tenant, wage labor, and sharecropping farmers in rural post-emancipated post Texas engaged in these particular sartorial practices, this, book's at, this book asks three different questions. In what ways were sartorial practices embedded in relations and ideologies of race, gender, and class? And how did Black women negotiate these operations of power and oppression through dress? Given the relationship between fashion and the construction of hegemonic notions of femininity, are Black women's clothing and adornment practices representative of resistance and or conformity to these notions? And is there evidence of formations of a, of a distinctive Black feminism, of a distinctive Black womanhood, excuse me? And finally, as African-American women move through various spaces, at home, at work, and in public spaces, during a time of heightened racial oppression, how are their choices regarding dress influenced? How are their choices of clothing and adornment situational to the spaces that they occupy? So this book primarily focuses on artifact assemblages consisting of clothing, adornment, grooming, and clothing maintenance artifacts recovered from the Levi Jordan plantation. So Levi Jordan Plantation is located in Brazoria County, Texas, which is about 60 miles south of Houston, Texas, between Metagoria County and Galveston County along the Texas Gulf Coast. By 1848, when Levi Jordan arrived in Brazoria County to establish a sugar plantation, the area already had a strong plantation economy based on sugar and cotton production. The county's location along the Texas Gulf Coast provided easy access to Atlantic waterways for the transportation of goods and people. As a result, Brazoria County as a port county provided shops in the region access to a wide variety of goods, both nationally and internationally for purchase by both black and white county residents during the antebellum and postbellum eras. Archival research revealed that African-Americans that lived at the Levi Jordan plantation bought goods from the Jordan store, as well as from other shops in Brazoria County with cash and store credit. So archeological research at the Levi Jordan Plantation encompassed over three decades of work and a number of people and organizations. Most notably is the work conducted by Dr. Kenneth Brown, an associate professor at the University of Houston, 
who excavated at the site from 1986 till 2006. Since 2002, the site has been state owned with plans under the direction of the Texas Historical Commission to transform the plantation into a premier public heritage site for the interpretation of slavery in the state of Texas. So during the tenure of Brown's work, he located a number of structures at the site. The image on the, on the slide outlines these structures in red. The main house, barn, detached kitchen, and to the south of the plantation, four cabin blocks were discovered that housed the enslaved and later tenant farmers who labored at the site. Three of the four blocks housed six individual cabins aligned in two columns, while one block housed eight individual cabins aligned in two columns. A total of 19 cabins had at least one excavation unit placed in them. However, for the purposes of my research, I examine artifacts from the seven most extensively excavated cabins located in blocks two and one. So the Levi Jordan Plantation Assemblage is now housed at the Texas Historical Commission's Archaeology Storage Facility is an example of what some in the field might call a legacy or orphaned assemblage, a, a large collection of material culture that has not been re-examined since 2002. Collections like the Levi Jordan Plantation Assemblage raise ethical and intellectual dilemmas within the field as state facilities are overflowing with material culture primarily recovered through cultural resource management firms that are minimally studied. Pulling from Whitney Battle Baptiste again, she claims that the reexamination of artifact assemblages pertaining to the African diaspora is a Black feminist archaeology project, stating that, quote, it remains essential for us to look back, reflect, and at times even alter sites that were excavated and interpreted in the past, end quote. Dr. Kenneth Brown's work at the Levi Jordan Plantation resulted in over 600,000 artifacts related to, the Af related to African American life during the antebellum and postbellum eras, making it the largest collection of its kind in the state of Texas. While he and his students produced a few articles and an MA thesis based on the assemblage, primarily before the, complete, primarily before the completion of excavations at the site, all of this work has focused on the era of enslavement with little discussion regarding the experiences of those who lived and labored at the site after 1865. The book, this book project takes up Battle Baptiste's call for a re-examination of a collection, rich in material culture data that can tell us more about the lived experiences of African-Americans in post-emancipated Texas. However, this of course is not without its own limitations. Moving into the methodology specifically when re-examining orphan collections, one of my first goals working at this or working with this collection was establishing a chronology of the site. According to Brown's 2012 technical report, there are no real diagnostic shifts in the soil to infer a natural stratification across the site. And as a result, he dug in five by five foot units down tenths of a foot levels using engineering rulers in an attempt to base stratification at the site on the presence or absence of artifacts, which unfortunately was not uniform across the site from block to block or within the blocks from cabin to cabin. Having come to the Levi Jordan Plantation Assemblage with scholarship primarily focused on the antebellum era, I wanted to see if testing, I wanted to see if teasing out the antebellum and postbellum time periods were possible. So typically historical sites that date to the 17th through the 19th century in the Atlantic world focuses on shifts in ceramic production as a means of relatively dating the sites. As we enter to the 20th century in the onsite of automatic machine bottles, um, it makes technological shifts in glass production more diagnostic for the early 20th century, um, for early 20th century sites well into the 1950s. However, in-depth diagnostic attributes for ceramics at the Levi Jordan, um, for ceramics in the Levi Jordan database were never recorded beyond ceramic rare type, including porcelain, whiteware, and stoneware, and no diagnostic information on decoration type, such as hand printed, transfer print, decal, shell, or feather edge molding all of which would have provided more information for a seriation of the site based on frequency of ceramic attributes. I ran into the same problem examining glass within the database. There was a lack of diagnostic attributes pertaining to glass, including manufacturing technique, decoration type, et cetera. And it made using these two more traditional artifact classes for relative dating unreliable. As a result, I turned to the distribution of artifacts. Of, as a result, I turned to the distribution of wire nails with a TPQ of 1885 and cut nails to establish a late post-1885 and early period at the site. 
using an abundance indices with ceramics as a baseline from which to draw proportions of other artifact classes did demonstrate slight proportional shifts in different artifact classes across the site for bead, button, glass, and fauna. However, with wire now signifying the onset of the late period, it ultimately means that quite a bit of material culture in the early phase could actually be post-1865. We know from the settlement of the plantation in 1848 to the destruction of the quarters area in 1910, based on area photographs, that the occupation of the blocks were about 50 years. Establishing an early and late period while not directly correlating to the antebellum and postbellum era timeframe, has demonstrated shifts in the distribution of particular artifact classes over time, more of which that I will speak to during my discussion of the interpretations or my interpretations of the site. So I'm gonna shift um, from a site background to really orient us to the post-emancipation era. I open this section with a present with I open this section with a quote from Mariah Snyder, an ex-enslaved woman who labored and lived in Texas and a circa 1895 photograph of African-American men, women, and children picking cotton. Mariah states, quote, we wore low clothes and I never seen no other kind of dress till after surrender. Within the captured sepia tones of the stereoscope are the complexities of race, gender, class, and age realities experienced by African-American farmers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Women are dressed in gowns, fastened with hook and eye buttons, along with gingham blouses that match their patterned headscarves. These were coupled with coarse cotton petticoats fashioned with light tone aprons. Dried cotton bristles pricked at the flesh of these laborers as they picked bowls of cotton that were placed into the bottoms of sacks that were slung over their shoulders. This labor was not gendered. Everyone labored in what seemed like endless fields of white cotton or green sugar cane stalks and coffee plants. Men were dressed in dark trousers, which were held up with tin and copper alloy belt buckles as well as suspender fasteners. Trousers were coupled with light colored shirts that were then accompanied with black soft slashed hats. This labor also knew no age limit. It was learned by the young as soon as they were able to participate. Thus the socialization of labor and dress passed from adults to children as evidenced by the young girl dressed in her own gingham gown and patterned headscarf that matched the clothing of adult women picking cotton nearby. The young girl stands next to a nearly full wicker basket that reached up to her waist, adding what she could to the collection. Surrender, as Mariah Snyder called the emancipation of roughly 4 million African-Americans in 1865, marked the start of the Reconstruction era, which brought with it new challenges and opportunities. In Snyder's work, Progress Administrative Ex-Slave Narrative, she notes clear differences in sartorial practices from the antebellum and postbellum eras. Lowell clothes, named after the Lowell mills that, spunk, that sprung up in the Northeast, were made of coarse cotton cloth that the enslaved were provided by plantation owners and were often produced on site by enslaved seamstresses. The cloth provided was plain, was plain in design and a great deal of knowledge and skill was needed on part of the seamstresses. Additionally, decoration and stylization came from those came from the enslaved who throughout many of their WPA narratives, recount the myriad of ways they dyed their clothes with sumac berries or sweet gum bark to align with personal aesthetics. The postbellum era brought with it the rise of consumer culture and different avenues of market accessibility that contributed to opportunities for newly emancipated African-Americans to engage in different sartorial practices within the bounds of economic and geographic access while they navigated racial and gender subjugation in their everyday lives. It is the buttons, buckles, hook and eyes, along with hair combs and jewelry, which are a testament to the ways tenant farmers, sharecroppers and wage laborers who lived and worked at the Levi Jordan plantation during the post bellum era engaged in sartorial practices. Within historical archeology, span within historical archeological scholarship on adornment, the multivariant meanings behind artifacts recovered in the archeological record that relate to dress practices are tools for the formation of identity. Identity analysis within the field of archeology span provides the foundation of adornment studies, paving an avenue for historical archeologists span to interpret past formations of identity by critically examining the small things to pull from Carolyn White and Mary Boudrain. 
beads, buttons, rivets, suspenders, bodices, hairpins, hook and eyes are some of the small things that along with documentary data can serve as evidence of iterative practices pulling from Lemisco's work that make up sartorial practices of self-making engaged by individuals. So doing this work really required applying an analytical framework that centered the intersecting operations of race, gender, and class that structured the social lives of Black women in the past. The theoretical framework that guides this research is Kimbrough Crenshaw's theorization of intersectionality, which locates the positionality of Black women at the intersections of race, gender, and class, operations of power and oppression. Intersectionality is the crux of Black feminist theory, as Patricia Hill Collins writes. This theoretical framework works to treat, quote, race, class, gender, and sexuality less as personal attributes and more as systems of domination in which individuals construct unique identities, end quote. Intersectional analysis illuminates axes of power and oppression that construct African-American women's past and present formations of identity. This theoretical approach aims to engender examinations of African-American history that at all times accounts for multiple facets of identity and the ways in which they've come to shape past social lives. Patricia Hill Collins' work, Black Feminist Thought, canonized Black feminist theory and epistemology as a valid entryway for knowledge production in academia. However, Hill Collins' work is built atop a history of words by Black women who for centuries have spoken, who for centuries have spoken about their social location in society and have produced a wealth of information from enslaved women to blues women to owners of beauty shops. Additionally, work by renowned anthropologists Zora Noel Hurston and Catherine Dunham has centered the lived experiences of Black women in their anthropological scholarship. And although Black feminist scholarship has made significant inroads within anthropology over the last two decades, and for those interested, you can start by reading Arma McLaren's Black Feminist Anthropology, published in 2001. Historical archaeology as a subdiscipline has not expanded to widely use this framework, except for a few cases. Black feminist theory within archaeological research is fairly new, less than 20 years old. It's the centering of intersectionality that differentiates Black feminism historically from that of mainstream feminist scholarship and the discipline. It's the latter that sets the foundation for most gender analysis and archaeological research. Although intersectionality has not made substantial inroads within the field of historical archaeology, where it is seen most clearly is in Black feminist archaeological scholarship. A small group of archaeologists, primarily Black women, began asking how the application of Black feminist thought can aid in the interpretation of African-American past of experiences in ways that did not compartmentalize multiple facets of Black women's experiences, but rather interpreted them as wholly complex. And on the screen, you can see a few of those words. There's Whitney Battle Baptiste's A Black Feminist Archaeology, and then Laura Wilkie's An Archaeology of Mothering. This call for Black feminist archaeology was a call for intersectional analysis. The possibility that Black feminist theory affords to archaeological scholarship on identity formation as far as seeing and the wealth of information to be gained from such an approach has hardly been explored. Black feminist archaeology illuminates the act of historicizing the positionality of past individuals that has to always account for the specificity of past operations of race, gender, and class. And through my implementation of Black feminist framework, I asked how processes of racialization, sexual exploitation, and economic disenfranchisement converge and diverge to shape sartorial practices of self-making among African-American women in the late 19th and 20th centuries. It's through this framework that I demonstrate how axes of power and oppression impacted and shaped the social lives of African-American women and the legacies of which are still being seen today. The implementation of a Black feminist framework within historical archeology span creates space to dehomogenize studies of identity. The work of Boudry and Mullins cautions against archeological scholarship on identity that in the quest for specificity runs the risk of essentializing human experiences. But feminism revels in the complexity of human existence, demanding that controlling images of Black women, stereotypes attached to Black female bodies laced with social historical ties to racism and sexism are questioned and complicated. Furthermore, in regards to my central objective to really dehomogenize de de African-American histories, the, app the application of a Black feminist framework contributes to existing scholarship on adornment and, and embodiment. 
While scholarship regarding the materiality of gender performances and embodiment center on performance theory, theory primarily outlines in mainstream feminist studies by Judith Butler, a few black queer theorists have criticized mainstream feminist scholars and you can look at Jafari Allen's as well as Omasheki Tinsley's work for examples for obscuring how race shapes the social world in which women of color operate. With this in mind, black feminist theory illuminates the act of historicizing embodiment and performance that has to always account for the specificity of past intersecting operations of race, gender, and class. So a little bit about the data that I used within the book project. I examined 2,860 artifacts related to clothing, adornment, hygiene, grooming, and clothing maintenance. And that amounted to about 2,231 buttons, 392 artifacts classified as jewelry, a classification comprised of wire, pendant, earrings, chains, watches, brooch fragments, along with 279 beads. Additionally, I examined 63 hair cone fragments, 11 hook and eye fasteners, and 160 clothing maintenance artifacts, including straight, including straight pins, safety pins, a bodkin, sewing needles, and owl and thimbles. So this project, within this project, documentary, material culture data is placed in conversation with both documentary and oral history data. Census records, the Levi Jordan postbellum, postbellum papers, historic advertisements from Montgomery Wade, as well as Sears and Roebuck catalogs, along with oral history collections gathered by Cheryl White in the early 1990s and Dr. Maria Franklin during the early 2000s, provide additional historical context that further illustrates the lived experiences of African-Americans during the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Texas. Finally, historic photographs are also used to gauge clothing trends during the post-emancipation era, I've taken a particular interest in stereo views from the late 19th and early 20th century. Ordinarily photographs of African-Americans from the mid 19th and early 20th centuries typically are portrait photographs where fancy dress practices are typically engaged or imposed upon. However, stereo views, have, however, stereo views were great at documenting quotidian dress practices of African-Americans producing finite details regarding sartorial practices over time. This of course is within its own, has its own limitations, which I'd be happy to discuss further during the Q&A section. The representation, the representation of everyday dress practices seen in stereo views initially drew me to these photographs. What got me hooked on them was the technology that was used to create them, which viewed through a stereoscope viewer would transform two-dimensional images into three-dimensional Im immersive photographic experiences where viewers can see the site as if they were there and could actually reach out and touch those who are being photographed. Ordinarily, when I do this presentation in person, I actually have stereo views that I carry with me and I have my own stereo viewer for the audience to actually be able to use so you could see them in motion uh, or see them for yourselves. But for here, I have a few slides um, uh, from the New York Public Library, which created this really amazing online tool called a Stereograminator that transforms historical stereo views into shareable 3D web formats. Additionally, the California Museum of Photography, which is right around the corner from a lot of us, hosts one of the largest collections of Keystone Mass stereo views from the 19th and 20th centuries. So many of the stereo views that I have in my own personal collection are also found at the museum. So if you can think about these as um, 19th century virtual reality technology that produce finite details regarding sartorial styles and types, and for my particular research, the use of clothing fasteners. So focusing on everyday modalities of being as spaces where constructions of black womanhood were formed, my examination of material culture data along with documentary, whoa, <laughs> Along with documentary and oral history data focused specifically on the way sartorial practices were shaped by the matrix of domination within spheres of labor, as well as due to the threat of racial sexual violence, desires for self-expression, and processes of social um, reproduction in complex ways. So returning to my first and second sub, sub questions. I initially asked, you know, given the relationship between fashion and the construction of hegemonic notions of femininity, are Black women's clothing and adornment practices representative of resistance or conformity to these notions? 
is there evidence of formations of a distinctive Black womanhood? Throughout this book, I argue that the construction of Black womanhood were embedded in relations and ideologies of race, gender, and class. Further, Black women as historical agents negotiated these operations of power and oppression through dress within the context of labor, violence, social reproduction, and just as significantly desire and creativity. Given the relationship between fashion and hegemonic notions of femininity, my interpretation suggests that women's clothing and adornment practices were representative of a complex entanglement of resistance and conformity to these notions. The clothing African-American women wore while doing agricultural labor was tied to negotiations of femininity, the realities of racial, gender, and class subjugation, and the necessity of functional clothing needed for rural Southern agricultural labor. Although African-American women tended to land, cooked over hearths, sold and mend and washed clothing, gender ideologies about women's appropriate dress were so influential that black women adhered to it even when their clothes, even when their clothes were often impractical for the kinds of labor they had to do. The clothing African-American women wore was incredibly restrictive for the kinds of labor that they had to perform. And within this project, I attempt to move away from the binary notion of resistance versus conformity by acknowledging that African-American women and their construction of identity occupy a space of contradiction pulling from Toni Morrison. Because black women are outsiders within pulling from Patricia Hill Collins, they dress themselves and live their lives in ways that illustrate the simultaneity of being woman, yet outside of the normalized ideals of femininity and womanhood. The palimpsests or layers of history of oppression written onto their flesh position them outside of what is deemed acceptable. And as a result, African-American women and their dress practices were neither fully liberating nor completely oppressive. Rather, their experiences were complex negotiations of power and how to maintain one dig one's dignity and define oneself. In regards to my question about evidence of formations of a distinctive Black womanhood, I would argue that Black womanhood is distinctive in so much as African-American women within the multiplicity of their social experiences have a shared history of oppression written onto their flesh that impacts the construction of identity. Thus, Black womanhood was both individually and collectively asserted. The evidence of jewelry as a form of adornment, in particular, the use of beads is one line of evidence that may speak to this dynamic. Rather than highlight a particular bead color or jewelry type, which often is what's done in African diaspora archeology, span that appears in higher frequencies across the Levi Jordan plantation, I focus instead on the wide variety of both, interpreting this as a desire for self-expression among African-Americans at the plantation that also falls within traditional African-American aesthetics of bold and contrasting color schemes. This African-American aesthetic is historically evidenced most widely in Black women's quilting, traditions, and textile trends seen in clothing. I suggest that the diversity in bead and button, and bead and button color allow African-Americans to distinguish themselves collectively from white Americans while simultaneously expressing individualism within group dynamics. And finally, returning to my third sub-question, I asked as African-American women move through various spaces at home, work, and in public spaces during a time of heightened racial oppression, how were their choices regarding dress influenced? How were the choices of clothing and adornment situational to the spaces that they occupied? I wanna answer this question by first looking at an early 20th century photograph of Hester Holmes, who as an enslaved woman labored at the Levi Jordan plantation in the main house and remained as a house servant after emancipation. She's wearing a short gown fastened with buttons and a dark colored petticoat likely tied with ribbon or fastened with hook and eyes around her waist. Her hair is pulled back and covered in a headscarf. Her hands are interlaced as she stares back at us. Her attire sits as a representation of how she maintained the Jordan home, clean and modest. This would have been the clothing Miss Holmes wore as she completed her daily tasks as a domestic servant, cooking, cleaning, laundering, and mending clothing for the Jordan family to then return to her own cabin and do housekeeping work, while perhaps even maintaining her own garden for subsistence needs. I look at Hester and I wonder how Black women's choices and dress were situationally shaped. As African-American women occupied spaces at home, at work, and in public spaces during a time of heightened racial oppression, their choices regarding dress were impacted by racial, racialized and gendered violence. The threat of white, of white terrorism against African-Americans increased during the post-bellum era. Within the post-emancipation era, tactics of social control and surveillance 
sumptuary laws similar to those of the colonial era had a reinsurgence in the South and practices of dressing down became fundamental to survival for African-Americans as they moved across the Texas landscape. I interpreted this as a possible situation practice, as a possible dress, situational dress practice engaged by African-Americans at the Levi Jordan plantation as evidenced by the high percentage of plain clothing fashioners recovered at the site. Now, while this could, now, while this could reflect a restricted market accessibility and poverty, I, I'd like to highlight once again that the Levi Jordan plantation was located along the Brazos River, providing both black and white residents access to a wide variety of goods. Additionally, there are slightly higher discard rates of decorative ceramics from the late period at the site, suggesting that African-American residents had the means to purchase more costly ceramic goods. However, there's a decrease in the discard rates of more costly clothing fasteners, such as glass buttons and one whole bone buttons, which were used in the production of more costly cloth covered fasteners, and a slight increase in the discard rate of plain, ceramics and, of plain ceramic and metal buttons. I argue that the prevalence of plain clothing fasteners may be indicative of a desire to dress down as a means of addressing the threat of racial and gender violence. Specific to African-American women who worked as domestic service, as, as domestic servants, dress practices engaged while laboring in the homes of white employers reflected modesty and cleanliness. And building on this interpretation, it should be noted that the act of dressing the body daily, physically adding layers of cloth, tying knots and ribbon to secure, to secure clothing, along with the tedious nature of fastening numerous hook and knives could have acted as an armor preventing eased access to the physical body by requiring additional labor. The desire to dress in particular ways while laboring in white spaces was in part a response to the threat of racializing sexual violence that black women faced from their white employers as black women pushed against controlling images of the hypersexualized black feminine body. However, we know that regardless of what women were wearing, the external threat of violence toward their bodies was ever present. What's important to note is that white homes were dangerous spaces for black women who were forced to meet the expectations of their white employers in terms of their appearance, including their dress in order to hold on to their jobs and de-escalate their visibility. So the application of black feminist theory in this research advocates for alter alternative theoretical approaches within the field of archeology span to address the multiplicity of identity formations in the past as a means of writing a more inclusive history of post-emancipated Texas. Avenues for future exploration of Black feminist archaeology steps within the field are far reaching. Intersectionality, the crux of Black feminist thought, has permeated the realm of archaeology, providing new scholars, uh, providing scholars new interpretive frameworks within the realm of historical archaeology. For example, the work of Edward Tennant Gonzalez looks at the digital recreation of Rosewood, Florida, um, an early 20th century site of white terrorism that displaced the Black community to explore this very notion through a landscape approach. The work of Dr. Rachel Watkins explores the influence of Black feminist thought in the realm of bioarchaeology, while Dr. Kathleen Sterling is exploring the expansive possibilities of Black feminist inspired interpretations within prehistoric archaeology. In 2017, at the annual Society for Historic Archaeology Conference, a symposium that was titled Intersectionality as Emancipatory Archaeology took place. And the symposium featured topics on archaeological education in K-12 settings, explorations of whiteness and reproductive health, as well as, the, the, as well as contemporary archaeological studies of garbage to understand present social dynamics in North, in North America. While intersectionality has been more widely utilized within the field, it must be remembered that it stems from a black feminist, it stems from black feminist thought, which is rooted in African and African diaspora studies genealogy. So I'm gonna end my presentation there. And before I um, accept questions, I have two shameless plugs. <laughs> One of which um, is that the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Riverside is currently inviting applications for a graduate program in anthropology with a special emphasis on global black diaspora for the 2020 and 2021 application cycle. Um, and as many of you may or may not know, we are a four-field department seeking to recruit students with an interest in race, anti-Blackness, Black queer, diaspora, African diaspora, archaeology, gender, social justice, and freedom. Um, and we also encourage international applications. And then my last shameless plug, 
um, is that I'm currently the co-PI of the Estate Little Princess Archaeology Project on the island of St. Croix. And I'm offering a summer field school opportunity through UCR Study Abroad Office for students, both within and outside of the University of California system. And the dates I believe are from June 21st through, the, through July 8th. And you can visit um, international.ucr.edu slash abroad slash F-L-E-A-P for more information and to apply. So with that, I'll end my presentation. <laughs>